Christmas Eve update on Kilauea Volcano's ongoing eruption here in December of 2020. Thanks for joining me. I'm going to try to keep it a little bit briefer today, although we have a lot to cover. Um, I will probably not be taking as many questions today, but feel free to drop them um, in the comments and I will address them when I can get them um, later on. Um, so thank you guys. Uh, thank you guys uh, who have been supporting our work. Um, thank you guys for um, tuning in to our broadcast and hope everyone has happy holidays and this is a very challenging year. So I'm going to start, start off with you guys by showing you guys this uh, new USGS video um, taken of an, of an overflight that happened yesterday. So you can see that they're um, flying across the caldera here, looking at the new lava lake. All the gas is coming out of that lake. It's filling in that lower pit. You can see that northern vent, kind of a center right, um, putting out all that gas. And now we're zoomed in on that western vent. So you can kind of see that it's spattering intermittently. Um, but there have been, it's kind of started and stopped again. So there's definitely some changes in how that, um, the, the dynamics of that vent is playing. Um, the video is going to switch here to the next vent over in just a second. And you guys may notice there's actually a second vent that was up here that's going to stop spattering since this video is playing. Now here's the main vent. This is the main vent of uh, the current filling on the east. And you guys can see that the lava level, and this was taken yesterday, the lava level is drown that lower part of the vent and so part of the vent is actually coming up through the lava down in here and so that's really fascinating and of course it's all that gas coming out from that one spot right over there all right so moving on we'll keep it quick you guys can always rewatch if you want um, can i see what i've got lined up here when i'm switching over but uh the next video i'm going to play you guys is this a uh, compilation um of the thermal thermal camera um, by the usgs showing that initial um, flash of steam changing from water lake to lava lake and this video is a little different than the ones I've been showing you guys it's got a little bit uh, better resolution so it's it's a uh, um, got frames for you know every 20 minutes or so perhaps um, or every few minutes as opposed to every hour like I've been showing you in the last few times so you can kind of see the sequence is pretty much the same here we are filling here's our our island drifting over to the west I'm sorry to the east and here's our eastern vent getting drowned you know getting closer and closer to being drowned by the rising level of lava. So this is where our eye is right now is um, when is this going to going to go completely under? And it seems like it'll, it'll probably be within the next day or so. All right, so that is our thermal camera. And so now let me take you guys to the webcams. And let's give this a refresh here. That's where we're kind of getting a little darker in the day here. So you can see, oh, we're not going to take the survey now. You can see that on the USGS webcam, you can still see this spot of red right in there, right? So that vent showing us the vent is still above the lava level, right? And the thermal imagery is a little harder to tell, but in the visible, it's quite easy to tell that this hardened crust of the lake is still down here. You can kind of see there's definitely some spots of glow where it's breaking apart and then it cracks, but that the vent is still poking above right over there. So it's not quite all the way under, but it's probably at least halfway, if not more than halfway under by this point in time. Um, so you can see scrolling down, we have, you know, um, Water views of the caldera and, the, and the, there's our most recent thermal image. And you can kind of see that in here. Looks like our vent is essentially almost drowned. It's kind of starting to, it's bubbling up a little bit right through the middle there. Let me see if I can zoom in for you guys to kind of see a little better there. All right, so you can see that's definitely still poking up above, but it now looks like there's lava kind of coming in the backside over here. I'm going to change my color. So you guys maybe can see that a little better, but you can see the lava is coming in the back over here. And this is probably just some of the spatter that's falling from the vent right over here, right? But so the actual spatter coming from here, but it seems to be some flow going on over here, right? So the thing is really getting drowned more and more and more. It's probably about to go under, possibly even tonight, yeah? So um, here's a daytime view of uh, the, the overlook camera. And you kind of see there's not a whole lot to see here. The lake is down. Um, over in this direction over here. So, and from the strip road, you can kind of see we've got some not quite as big a, a steam plume today, right? And it's kind of because the winds are, have been um, more dispersed, and we'll show you guys what the winds are. The winds are kind of blowing more towards the camera this way, it might be. So, all right, we'll move on. Um, we've looked at the thermal camera, we've talked about this drowning in the vent, so I'll move on from there as well and tell you guys what the most recent update issued by the USGS this morning um, is. 
And so the bottom line is no significant change. Um, they've reported as of 7 a.m., 169 meters, 554 feet deep. High SO2 emissions continued. They go on to elaborate 35,000 to 40,000 tons per day as measured on Monday and revised on uh, Wednesday. Um, seismicity is elevated but stable with few minor earthquakes and tremor fluctuations related to vigor of Fisher Fountaining. Two vents continued erupting on the north and northwest walls. The west vent was intermittently active. The north vent remains the most vigorous. Um, the lake is still filling. Increase of 12 meters, 39 feet over the past 24 hours. Um, yesterday, the surface was 69 acres and the lake shape was oval with the dimensions of 715 by 460 meters or in yards, 780 yards by 500 yards. Right, so... The island of cooler lava within the lake has been getting smaller and drifting eastward. It appears to be about 150 meters or yards in diameter and the slowest eastward movement as approached from the vent. So that's a text update and we'll move on. There's actually more today. Today is a Thursday um, and every Thursday online or Sunday in a, our print paper, the USGS uh, pins an article. Um, so this week's article written by USGS scientists uh, relates to their new, our new eruption. "'Twas a Sunday before Christmas, the eve of winter solstice, and the festive holiday lights, lights blinked of bright red and green. And then shortly after 9.30 p.m., Hawaiian Center time on December 30th, 30th so did the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory's Volcano Alert Level Aviation Color Codes for Kilauea. And they're making a joke there that they went straight from green to red, and red and green, it's the Christmas season, so um, I'm going to get that and appreciate that joke. Um, so you can kind of see that... Um, there's a whole article to read here. You guys can go online. Go online. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you guys. But I'm kind of pointing out a couple of things here. Um, well, one note we've been discussing is the aviation and color code level, right? They say, based on the patterns of earthquakes information, HVA was planning to increase Kilauea's alert level aviation code to an advisory yellow on Monday, December 21st. But the eruption started the night before instead. So you can kind of see that they were in the same, uh, th thinking the same kind of things as, as Dana and I were thinking in the previous few weeks. Um, um, but they didn't actually get a chance to elevate it to yellow before the eruption actually began. So, um, kind of going down in there, um, they kind of give give a lot of the same dimensions, talk about the, the details we've kind of discussed uh, previously. Um, and below that, uh, they have kind of an activity update that includes both Kilauea and Mauna Loa, right? And so you can kind of see that they have a, a shorter Kilauea Summary, Mauna Loa is not erupting as an advisory, and under Mauna Loa there were 60 small earthquakes less than um, 5 miles down. The largest was a 2.5, and everything's kind of back to background over there. So nothing's happening in Mauna Loa essentially there. Right? So moving on, one thing that they've highlighted in their Volcano Watch is this tracking the lava lake that we've discussed um, on our broadcast yesterday as well. And so I will recap a little bit of what we talked about yesterday on the lava level. and. All these black lines are kind of forming a curve. That's, I didn't drive very well. That goes that way. And on our plot over here, we've kind of approximated this with a with a cone, an inverted cone, right? That if we know the volume of the cone, and we know its depth or its height, as labeled here, then we can calculate the ratio between the radius and the height, right? And if we know that, then we can know that as the thing is increasing in volume, that the radius and the height will increase, you know, um, commensurately as well. So if the amount of volume coming into the lake is constant, which is a big, big if, but you know that's kind of a uh, what we need to need to assume to go through with this exercise, um, we will see that uh, these green dots right in here um, are the actual data, like a little bit of the, the the same kind of thing as we saw in the last plot, and you kind of see that the rate of increase would kind of be slowing over time because the, the the width of the top of that cone gets wider and wider and wider and so each amount of lava has got to spread out thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner and so it kind of like rises slightly slower and slower and slower and slower well, although it does still rise substantially over time right so that's just going to kind of recap of that and um we've discussed that for it to overcome that innermost pit it would have to rise somewhere to around the 800 meter elevation and we've kind of outlined what that might look like if it were to reach that level, right? Of course, big if, it'd have to be erupting the same rate as it is now for a long time, um, many more days. And in fact, if we go back here to our previous plot and we calculate, well, exactly when will we get to the 800 level, the bottom of that pit is at 520 meters. So if we add this line to that baseline, we essentially get to where we might see an 800 
coming in right around day 14 to 15, right? Whereas today we're on day four. So we're talking about another 10 or 11 days before it would actually overtop that pit. If, big if, it keeps filling at that same high rate that it has been so far. All right, so we've also, also uh, yesterday reviewed, um, if you were on the south side of the, of the volcano, looking in from a Kanakakoi overlook, which is at this elevation of about 1,100 meters, you'd have to look past this first little lip to see the lava lake. And so how high does lava have to rise for you to be able to see it? And the answer is about 760 meters. Um, that relates to about 2,500 feet elevation, right? Um, so um, on our map, and so let's look at, look at the what from the north. From the north, it's pretty similar, 780. Looking from the north over that little lip, slightly different as well. The lake would have to you know, rise to that level. And if we look over here, our 760 falls on day 10. 780 would fall on day 12. So we're looking at day 10 to 12. We're on day 4, so we're looking at about a week. Uh, maybe slightly less than a week if it goes at the same rate to where it would fill to be visible from the south side of the caldera. And another couple days beyond that to be visible from the north side of the caldera. Right? So that's kind of interesting. Um, what would that look like? That 760 contour line is somewhere right in here. Right? So that lake would be pretty full already by that point, but it wouldn't be quite to the top of that lip be pretty close. That's from the south and from the north it would be just a little bit beyond that. Right? To kind of give you guys an idea. I'm not going to draw it too well here because this is pretty hard to do with this mouse. So, but that kind of gives an idea of, you know, where it might actually be before you can see it. Well, the USGS today has put out a pretty uh, uh, you know, fantastic graphic comparing the size of the lake to the Empire State if it was placed at the bottom of it, right? Kind of at the, the base of it, at the very, very bottom of that crater. Even though it probably wouldn't fit straight flat on there, right? If you do a little excavation, but that's neither here nor there. So they've kind of indicated here in this more purplish color the former size of the lake and a former depth how far the water would have gone up the Empire State, State Building, right? Um, now the Empire State, State Building is um, 1,454 feet high with its antenna, right? As indicated here. For you guys who are doing metric, that's 443 meters. And so you can kind of see that it had risen up 50 meters. Um, it would have covered just that lower most, um, maybe the first, I don't know, uh, five or six floors or something like that of the Empire State, State Building. Whereas they calculated the lava depth now um, would have put it at around the 44th floor of the Empire State Building. And that would be 158 meters up, 518 feet above the crater floor. Yeah, fascinating. So. That's, that's pretty amazing. So kind of, kind of to take this a step further and related to what I just talked about just a second ago, um, how high would it have to rise to actually be visible from the south part of the, of the, of the caldera from the public overlooks? Well, it's, it's around this first little lip right in here, right? So that's around the 760 meter elevation. Um, that puts it around the 61st floor of the Empire State Building. From the north, it might be around the 67th floor, somewhere right in there. Um, and the point where it actually would spill over um, at 800 meters, that would be the 70, 70th floor, which is somewhere up in there as well, right? So um, the actual top of this thing, 1454, is a little bit lower than where the lava lake uh, would have been in 2018, which would have been about 1600 feet, 1650, somewhere in that range up here. So a couple hundred feet short, but the top of this thing is pretty close to where the crater floor was before, right? If that makes sense. All right, so um, I know I'm going a little bit fast, but uh, I kind of want to get through this, get back to my family. Um, but I definitely want to want to make sure to share with you guys um, all the interesting things happening here in Christmas Eve with this, this eruption of Kilauea. And I apologize that I'm not taking any questions right now, um, but uh, uh, I kind of want to want to make sure that we can um, all have a chance to see what's happening, um, but also not get not get slowed down here. So let me just kind of make sure that we are still going good here on our streams. Yep, so it looks like I, I am indeed um, streaming and I see you guys are asking questions. And I will kind of, I'll keep going here and if I have, have a chance at the end, I will, I will take some questions, but you know, I'm not going to take a whole lot because I want to make sure we get through just kind of quickly. 
So this is a paper we've been going back to quite a few times from 1981 uh, by Waj, uh, variations of magma discharge and basaltic eruptions. And today I want to show you guys something a little bit different, right? So because all of our, our discussions up until now and the rate of this filling, you know, how, how fast might it come over, when will, when will it spill over, when it might be visible, where is it visible from, all those things all depend on what we're assuming is the eruption rate. And we're, I'll be calculating that from the volumes provided by the USGS. Um, as well as how long it took to get to that volume, right? And so, you know, we're in a range for this eruption somewhere between 60 and 100, 60 and 90. It might, when I started at 100 and got down to 60, we might have averaged 71, somewhere in there, you know, something like that. But that's an average, right? When I'm, what, now this is a plot showing time on the bottom and on the right, on an on, on on upper plot, uh, up and down axis, um, vertical axis, we're looking at the effusion rate. Now, this is a technical term that's actually talking about how fast is the lava coming out of the ground at any instant in time? And so you can kind of see that when an eruption actually starts right in here, it starts coming out of the ground very fast. And then it kind of starts coming out a little bit less and less and less and less and less. And that's a typical pattern over time, right? You kind of pop your cork right there. And then the thing is venting its gas and coming out. And as it happens, the flow kind of wanes all the way down here. So without kind of looking at every moment in time and figuring that out, we essentially take an average of that, which is what we call this eruption rate, right? So you can kind of integrate the same area in this yellow box right in here to be the same area as, as underneath this curve. And so you kind of basically then have an approximation for the whole eruption as a whole um, without um, looking at the details of minute by minute, hour by hour, and those variations, which naturally happen as well, right? So, um, so this is to say that we know the eruption rate is going to change, um, right, um, based on, on how eruptions always go. And so that assumption about how it's going to be filling at the same rate is likely not going to be true. It may actually be a little bit delayed from these projections we're, we're calculating for you guys. But it's a fun thing to do, and it's a you know, good exercise to go through, and you know, we'll see how it actually plays out. We might be you know, within, within a few days, hopefully, and that assumes nothing major changes before then, which is also quite possible, right? So uh, moving on, you know, um, we've discussed before in the previous updates how the eruption rate, if it's very high, seems to correlate to very short durations and vice versa, right? Kind of in this inverse relationship. So if we have a very low eruption rate, you might expect it to go longer. But if we look at the details of what these plots, you know, these single plots look like, and kind of see that a very long eruption, let's say like Pu'o'o, right? You might actually have quite a high um, effusion rate at the beginning, and then it drops off very quickly, but then it kind of tails off for a long, 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 long time until it peters out, right? In our case, that was like some 30 years or so, right? If you're somewhere in the middle, um, you might go up very fast as well, and it peter off not quite as slowly, right? Now, if you're at the very high end of eruption rate, you actually go up quite fast, and you come down quite fast as well. So there's a lot of variation in how that actually plays out, and you know, um, in the grand scheme of things, we're actually more here in the middle than this current eruption. We're not anywhere that high compared to eruptions of the past. And we're not as low as pool eruption as well. We're kind of right in the middle, kind of an average, if you will, you know, a typical um, eruption here. So, um, for example, we mentioned yesterday as well, this is Kilo Iki, and Kilo Iki, you can see its effusion rate here over the first few days actually ramped up not quite as quickly, but actually peaked and then dropped back down as it then interacted with the height of the vent. So you can kind of see that. Um, once the vent got drowned, its effusion rate essentially dropped to zero. But then you can imagine our eruption rate would have been like an average, something like that. That box is this one right in here, right? And so you can kind of see we have another one, and another one, and another one. And you can just imagine how much black is on a page. This area indicates how much volume is coming out, right? And the width of it is how long it takes to do that. So here at the very end, you can kind of see very short intervals. Um, but very high rates for short times um, as it happens. And so that's one possibility of my, what might change in the dynamics of our vent as, as the fissures are drowned by lava as well. Um, the fissures may eventually stop because of the way that the magma above them is pushing back enough to offset the pressure of the rising gas. Um, but at some point, the gas is going to build enough to push its way through and kind of restart it. So you might have the start, stop, start, stop effect like we're seeing over here. I've been mentioning with the guys for Kilo Iki for a while. And of course, the other possibility we've discussed before is that it may actually um, maintain an open vent if there's enough pressure to actually prevent the, the backflow of lava. It can actually stay open and kind of stay open and circulating more dynamically for longer. And we've seen regular you know, eruptions on Kilauea that have lasted many, many months doing that kind of thing. But to that, for that to happen, the actual uh, eruption rate has to go down, right? For it to kind of draw out longer, we have to have less lava coming out. 
um, has to be coming out less fast. So that's kind of one thing to we're watching for here, and um, we will keep an eye on that. All right, so we're going to switch to our monitoring signals now. And I don't feel like I am missing one here. Got my, I am missing one here. So we're going to go here to our H field deformation page, then look at Kilauea. And on this plot, we can see that we don't really see a whole lot of detail on this two-day plot. Um, we can kind of still see where we started off. It's been less than a week on our one-week plot. But really, we got to go back to our one-month plot to see the real size and scale of this thing, right? We're now down to minus 30 microradians. So that's the number on the side over here. And we started off at about plus 10. So now we're now at 40 microradians drop, right? And microradian, for those of you guys who are joining in not familiar, is equivalent to about a, a, the width of a penny uh, with a tilt of a long bar of metal laying on a penny and the bar of metal being about a half mile long. So that tiny, tiny amount of tilt, one millionth of a radian, if you guys are familiar with radians and degrees, a micro radian. So these are very small amounts, but detectable, and they actually are, are very well linked to volcanic deformation and signals of how the magma is moving through the volcano. And that's why we look at these so closely, especially during eruptions when things are changing on a time scale that these instruments are most sensitive to. All right, so kind of going down and looking at our GPS, you can kind of see here that our this is this particular GPS plot is actually a distance plot across the caldera from north to south, showing how how wide it actually is. Right, you can kind of see it's been spreading, spreading, spreading. That's this whole phase here as it's going up. Right, it's spreading because magma is coming in from below. It's pushing up. It's spreading it apart, and you can kind of see here for the last um, month or so, it's been climbing quite high. Right, we had that little. Uh, intrusion beginning of December and then kind of a little bit of an adjustment and kind of climbing high building interruption now and then since then we've had a big drop you're gonna see these three points over here on the right all right these three points on here on the right kind of showing that the thing is contracting right the summit is actually sagging back in and itself as the pressure is being relieved that's an important thing to note because that indicates that the eruption can stop you know if it was still filling and spreading then it can't stop yet and so we're in a situation where it could stop Although we have a lot to go through still as far as the gas pressure being the main driver at this point in time, right? All right. Um, Five-year plot, a little bit harder to see because it's a lot more condensed in there. So if we move over to, over to Pu'o'o and look at the Pu'o'o data, um, you might see a little bit of a change, a little bit of a drop going down over here across the distance across the East Rift Zone. You know, So maybe the East Rift Zone is contracting a little bit too. It's hard to exactly tell. Um, but you know you can kind of see that that scale of range of up and down is something that's happened here in Pool before without any eruption happening. So it could be um, um, more local adjustments to Pool within the rift zone, right? And the rift zone does have magma in it. It's just a matter of like how much it can pressurize, and the pressure right now is all staying up at the summit, right? Um, but um, on a topic of the GPS and the tilt, you know we can kind of look into a little bit more detail, and let's sh uh, switch here to looking at some of the other stations that exist in the volcano. So um, these are all summit stations. They're all showing this kind of down pattern, right? The deflation is all typical. Um, some stations aren't coming in continuously like this one, but you can kind of still see some data in there. But the one that's, the one that's more interesting, we pointed out yesterday, is this, east, this escape road, um, kind of an upper southwest rift, right? And what you can see here is that right around midnight on between a, the 20th and 21st, we had that 4.4 earthquake. That might have been 10.30 p.m. right in here, 4.4 earthquake. And this big spike, this vertical spike you guys see right in here, that's the jolt that the Earth shook with a seismograph up and over, right? And can I see that since then, our north component, the blue line over here, has been rising, right? So it could be tilting because one, one possibility is that the south flank, after it moved, allowed a little bit change in the pathway, you know, from the summit to the upper east rift, and we may have movement of magma into the upper east rift as well because of the pressure in the summit. Um, of course, it's not getting anywhere past that. We don't really see any signals anywhere beyond this upper, upper, upper station, which is part of the area that was quaking before this whole thing began. And so it's no, no big surprise there. We don't really have a whole lot of data further down. This is the, um, the next station down at East Rift Zone over at Pu'o'o. You can see it's not providing data right now. But most importantly, the station at Janica, which is down in the uh, upper, lower East Rift Zone, um, you can kind of see that same earthquake signal was felt quite strongly, but no change in any of the tilts since then, right? So that's that's the kind of signal we're looking for, and that's why we say nothing has changed in a, in a lower east rift zone, right? So looking at GPS a little bit more, um, in that area of Mauna Ulu, right? This is kind of the, where the bend of the rift zone is, is Mauna Ulu. You can kind of see that there is 
um, not been any major change as well, right? You can kind of see that there's maybe a little bit of a response here to the pressure to summit and then kind of the release, but kind of the trend is is mostly unchanged. And the trend here is, you know, changing on a very small scale, right, within a, within the range of what has changed before here at Manaulu, right? So um, there's nothing, anything f further down in the rift zone as well. You can kind of see that you don't really see any kind of change in signals here on the right of any of these graphs in here, if you guys can see that, right? But if I go back up and we look at the summit stations, right, you can kind of see that all the summit stations are adjusting. This one here is a crater rim. You can kind of see a couple of data points starting to come in over here and over here. Right, you can kind of see some more adjustments. And we won't, won't go into the detail of what all these adjustments, which directions they actually go, right? But uh, you can kind of see that all the stations are on a summit, the crater rim, the outlet station, the Byron's Ledge station, the Uwekahuna station, um, which is the one that the, the plot that we looked at earlier with the distance is based off of. Um, these are all showing those adjustments happening in here, right? And so that's something you should look at. We can look at more detail in the future as well. I want to point out that it is happening for you guys. I want to go and look a little closer. So some more signals here. We're going to look at the seismographs. And so if you guys remember on a, on a very first or second day, I showed you guys some of the seismographs. And we basically had um, a period at that point in time, it was kind of more white in this upper part of the image. And then down here, it got really dark ink, blue, and then kind of let up, let up a little bit. And that was the beginning of the eruption. The tremor, essentially, I described this as the harmonic vibration on the walls of the conduit, right? So all the fluid is shooting out of there and it's vibrating the walls. It's not that different from blowing through a recorder. And in that case, the fluid air is going against the walls of the recorder and it comes out and it vibrates in an audible um, pattern that we can hear. So the same thing, the seismometer is listening to the vibrations of that conduit as the ground is trembling, right? So that's how it looked before. I, um, I, I uh, did not have a chance to pull one back up here and um, compare it for you guys, but I want to point out to you guys what's happening now is we don't have anywhere near as black in any of the seismographs, and overall the pattern is kind of blacker up here, darker blue, and getting lighter, right? Down here, it's actually not as much ink as there is up here. So that tells us the tremor is decreasing, and this is just one station by the summit, so let's, let's kind of look. Similar pattern there, darker to top. This is a station that's kind of funky, and let's, we can ignore that and skip it over. There, uh, as well, darker at the top. You can kind of see, you know, really not a whole lot of tremor happening here at the bottom. Of course, part of that as well is the fact that the vent is being drowned, right? So two effects there, right? You know, um, you could have less gas coming out, but you also could have that, you know, the vent's not all the way drowned. And so we'll see what changes when that happens. But some of this change here in, in the last few hours may be related to that as well, right? You have less, less nozzle sticking out that can actually vibrate, you know, um, um, although there might be vibrations underground as well, even as magma moves up to the lava lake through the ground before it actually gets there. And that vibration should be picked up as well. And so the fact that overall and in, in total, you have less ink than these lower parts of the seismographs uh, indicates that the thing, that the uh, venting of gas may be, it may be slowing down. It's hard to say, but the dynamics are certainly changing in some way, right? Maybe it's coming out a different way. So interesting thing to keep an eye on as well. There's a sand hill, same kind of pattern, right? Um, these kind of long period earthquakes kind of often indicate more of that magma movement. Um, and these are kind of your more typical smaller earthquake patterns of small breaking of rock. Overall, we haven't had a whole lot of earthquakes, right? So you can kind of see how scroll down a little bit more. And there's another funky station. Overall, the pattern is still kind of the same, kind of darker to top and kind of getting less and less ink towards the bottom, right? So well, you can still see quite a bit of tremor. Still, the thing is definitely elevated above background levels as stated by the USGS. All right, so... Um, Looking at the monitoring signals, let's see. I want to, let's jump to this one, jump to the earthquakes first, and I'm gonna refresh this for you guys. And let's put it to the newest first. And so you can kind of see, we've actually just had a 1.8 earthquake off of the west coast of the island over here, um, off of Kailua Kona. We've had a 1.8, and a 1 point and a 2.1 down here in Pahala, very, very deep. This is our kind of supply zone for the volcano, very, very deep. Imagine the magma comes up very deep under here and somehow works its way over very deep to under here, and then it comes up that conduit in our Kilauea right in there. And that zone of production of magma, we believe, also feeds Mauna Loa, and it also feeds Loihi Volcano, which is underwater right over here. And those are all interesting things to talk about on some future updates, and I'm sure I'll prompt some questions and we'll kind of answer those in, in a chat as we have a chance. So overall, you guys can see not that many big earthquakes. Um, 
scrolling down the list over here, I see a 2.4, a 2.3, really kind of small ones, and kind of zoom into the Kilauea area, you really see there's not much happening at all at the summit, right? It's kind of, you can really see this sagging of pressure. And similar thing, you know, a little bit, a couple on a south flank, you can see nothing on a, on a lower east rift zone or in a rift zone altogether as a whole. All right, so um, now I will come back to this page, which I've put up a couple times already. Um, so this is a USGS photo and video chronology. To remind you guys, you can get here from the USGS main homepage, right? They have these new hot links. You get the latest information, eruption information right in here. You can kind of look at the quick links to alert, monitoring maps, the text update I showed you guys, the maps link I showed you guys before, those and videos, webcams, you know, air quality. All these things are all kind of, there's quick links right over here in this current, current alert section, right? So, and then here below we have our news section, section as well. So. The Volcano Watch I mentioned, read, read a little bit to you guys, the chronology we're going to go into right now, and then you can kind of see we're back down to yesterday over here. So they've also plotted the, this uh, observed depth of the lava lake um, on a new graphic putting on a homepage. So before we have one that showed the water lake depth, of course, that's no longer valid. Uh, so now it's been replaced by this particular graph. It's the same as that one we saw with the black dots that were kind of, you know, um, working their way up here and then I drew that really bad curve through it like that right so it's, it's the same kind of plot it's just going to portray it a little bit differently and so we can kind of see here a view from this morning um, from the USGS there is that vent kind of just peeking above the rising lava lake which in the daytime you see looks like that kind of silvery gray crust because that crust is freezing and it's a very cold air and forming that in just the crust that's moving rafting around underneath all that lava that's flowing underneath there right and we also still have our island, which moved from over here to its current position over the last over the last uh, day, couple days or so, um, kind of pulled in by the circulation of the lake. So you can kind of see it was very, very hazy this morning when this photograph was actually taken. So um, this is a nice image here um, that the US just put up with a little slider, right? So you can slide it to the right. You can see here what, it, what the webcam image looks look like when it was pointing at the lake of water. And we'll slide it to the left, and we can see a more recent view of a lava lake filling that pit. Water, lava, water, lava. Right? So fascinating. There's another image I'd like to show you guys of this as well. And let's see if I, uh, I'll, I'll bring it up. I'll bring it up for you guys here. Um, this is something that uh, Ryan Finley at Hawaii Trekker put together. So you can kind of see he actually just composited the images and you can see the shadow of the lava lake in here. I'm sorry, of the water lake in here and the shadow of the lava lake in here. So you can kind of compare them one right over the other um, in a visual sense, um, what they actually look like. Right? So hawaiitracker.com, you know, we are part of the Hawaii Tracker team. We do appreciate the work we do. Uh, thank you guys all who have been, been, been donating, donating to us recently. Really appreciate it. If you guys want to support our work, you know, there you are. That's, that's how you do it. Okay, so um, we were back over here on a USGS image page. So um, here you see again another image. There is the island once again. There is the vent coming out, right? It was quite a, there's part of it under the lake, more or less right in here. They actually zoomed in. So we're gonna zoom into this area right in here, the very, very edge, maybe right over here, in fact, you know, at the very edge of this lake, right? We're still in the sunshine. And you kind of see there is the edge of the island, right? This is actually liquid lava all through here. Can't tell because it's got that crust, right? You can kind of see here, how it's not breaking, but kind of bending over, right? That's a very, very hot rock if it can bend like that without actually cracking, right? So it's just a crust, a very thin crust on a fluid lava that's looking kind of silvery in this day time. So you can kind of see, and they put, out, put this out in a caption here, unlike the surrounding lake surface, the island appears to be composed of fragments of ejecta, right? That's the stuff that it kind of exploded and landed all around, right? It may have originated from violent lava water interactions in the opening hours of the eruption when the lake was boiled off. So there they're speculating that this may be the interaction of the lava with the water that might have, you know, caused explosions, might have caused different, different, maybe a different density of rock, right? That now is is somehow more resistant um, and is kind of being pushed around by the lake and consumed. It's definitely shrinking. It's being consumed from the edges, right? Um, but it's it's taking a long time for that to happen. This is fascinating. We're, we're going to talk a little bit later about the history of the, of the caldera, and we've seen other islands of of rock floating in lava lakes many, many times before. 
So we'll compare our, the, the actual island we have here today, um, which USGS has mentioned in the past. And the update I mentioned earlier today, 150 meters across. So that's long. It's longer than a football field, right? This this lake, or I'm sorry, this island in the lake just itself is longer than a football field. Okay, one and a half football fields. I think football field might be something like that size in there, right? So these are really massive, massive features. These photographs don't do it quite justice, right? These are these are big, big vents. A lot of lava coming out of there, right? Shooting, it was shooting in the air at the beginning, uh, about 160 feet, 50 meters in the air, right? So, and that's the zoom in image we're looking at right over here. So, come down. You guys can see this is the that that same Empire State graphic we talked about a little earlier, um, and they have a couple of videos I showed you guys earlier today as well, right? So, that is the. Um, latest imagery from their webpage, but I also want to make sure we kind of cover our air quality, right? Because the biggest impact of this eruption to everyone on the island today has been the actual gas levels. Um, it's been very, very boggy the last couple days, especially all over the island, right? And so if we actually look at, um, this is back from 3 p.m., I'll reload it here right now, um, 5.45 p.m. timestamp over here on the right, and can I see we're at moderate yellow in ocean view currently right at this exact moment. Ocean view is measuring a 0.1 to 8 ppm of SO2. Right, but you can kind of see that every spot on the island has measurements. Hilo has got, a, got is registering barely. Kona is registering more. Mountain View, Pahala, um, Kamehameha Schools, Naalehu as well. Right, and we can kind of see why this might be happening. Let's gonna let's go to our VOG map, um, or VMAP page here. We can kind of see our silver aerosols. Let's give it give it a chance to load here. You can kind of see that the source is noted right here by the star, right? Here's the actual vent. And the gas is blown downwind, kind of blew more this direction yesterday, but you can kind of see based on the weather pattern of winds on the island, how quickly it actually disperses. And so it's not dispersing very quickly. You can kind of see that in ocean view um, right in there. Let's try that in red. In ocean view, that kind of southern area, that's the most at the most affected area, although you can clearly see South, South Kona is bad as well. Kona has got some oranges in here as well, right? And this is the particulate matter. Um, um, and of course, we go to, go to the SO2 just itself. The SO2 not as quite as bad. You can see it over here in Kona, right? And so, to remind you guys, our SO2 page, where, where did it go? Um, Short-term SO2 advisory is only reporting on SO2. And we have to go to our state air quality page to get all of it, right? And so here we can actually click on SO2. I gotta reload it. So, you can click on SO2, and you can see I'm actually reading a 121 over here in Ocean View as a maximum amount. I click on it, I can kind of go back and see that that happened. Um, that right now it looks like it may be in the orange, that 121, right? But it actually was in a purple, and in an ultra purple, purple up here, measuring as high as 500 ppm of SO2 earlier today, between 7 a.m and 11 a.m. right that's really intense we you know we heard from some friends some friends living in ocean view um waking up to that really bad bad fog having to close all the windows and all that so it's certainly a, a issue that everyone on the island has to deal with as well you know and that's not mentioning any of the agriculture um agriculture impacts as well so so2 right there we can also click on particulate matter right and ocean view is also showing a lot of pm 2.5 um signal as well right so very interesting to kind of see that as well so let's look at the National Park page here and let me make sure we have current data by reloading and you can kind of see that at the visitor center we had increased SO2 um, kind of in the early morning hours 6 a.m. We had increased particulate matter last night around 6 p.m. So if anyone was in the park last night it was foggy right very foggy in the park you guys trying to see the glow of the eruption and this morning also very very bad and since then um, most of the day today has been in the green since the winds have kind of shifted over, right? But that's true also, like just in the over the parking lot of the visitor center, over by the steam vents, that was uh, more last night by the campground uh, early this morning. And we had to go down to over southwest Kahuku facilities and cross vents. This is the ocean view area we see for both SO2 and particulate matter showing these red spikes here on our plots, right? So this is another way we can kind of keep an eye on it. And since Wendy's got such a cool animation here, we can kind of see our VOG, what, what the VOG is actually doing. You might notice that 
we now have much more of a pull in this direction, right? Um, as the winds have kind of changed and kind of pull, pulled things back across a lot of our island and many of the other islands in here. So interesting to go back here to, uh, to the, the state page. We can kind of see that as far as all of it, we don't really have any effect on any of the other islands visible now. I mean, they are measuring values, right? Um, but they're not into the critical threshold right there. All right. So we will uh, just make sure that we review the USGS Facebook page because that's another good place to check out that um, all their imagery. And so here they have their thermal time lapse. There is that same lava depth in better state, right? So the slider, you can kind of see that we've covered all this stuff in here as well, right? And as well on Twitter, they're still putting things out on Twitter. Of course, it's Christmas Eve. We're going to keep the update today a little bit shorter. Um, we're going to um, follow the SGS's lead here. They're also um, a little bit putting out a little bit less information today, which is which is fine because if my information put out in the last few days has just been massive. You guys have seen how long it's been taking to go through all the information every day with how much we have to share with you guys. Yeah. So um, you can see on Twitter we have an update, a text update as well. These are coming out through Twitter once in a while as well. Update December 24th, 4 30 p.m. Two fissures continue to erupt and are getting closer to being drowned by the growing lava lake. No change in hazard is expected when that occurs. SO2 emissions and seismic, seismic tremor continue to be elevated, right? So no matter what happens with the dynamics of the vents, how much lava they're putting out, the hazard is not going to change. They're emphasizing that here, and that's definitely worth, worth stating. And for you guys who maybe are not aware, this eruption is all within a big pit. I like to call it the lava stadium, right? Once it comes up high enough, that's the best place for the lava to be. You can go all around all the crater and all angles and look down into it like a giant stadium. It can't spill out of there unless it fills a lot, a lot, a lot of space. There is like no one's house. There's no one's livelihood. Everyone's there by choice. So it's a great place. It's the best place for the lava to be. Right? So um, they're mentioning the Volcano Watch article, and you can kind of see um, same kind of topics over there as well. So finally, over here, Mauna Loa um, is a volcano that's also at alert level yellow, right? As we were kind of indicating that, that Kilauea might, might have been um, qualified to be um, even as much as a month ago, right? And so they are issuing weekly updates for the volcano, right? As opposed to Kilauea, where we're getting monthly updates before the eruption actually began. So our weekly update coming on Thursday is from Mauna Loa. Mauna Loa is not erupting. Everything is normal. I read you guys for the volcano watch thing as well, but it's essentially it's the same information. 60 earthquakes, largest of 2.5, um, back to long-term trends. GPS measurements continually show slow long-term summit inflation consistent with magma supply to the volcano's shallow storage system. Gas concentrations and temperatures are all the same and stable. No changes in webcam. So right now, Mauna Loa is taking a break and just kind of waiting for Kilauea to finish its turn. However long that takes, right? And, you know, and if it takes long enough, then maybe something else will just in Mauna Loa. But for now, there's nothing to see on Mauna Loa. It's actually quite boring. So um, that is the, the bulk of my update today. I will check for some questions here. Just to remind you guys, we're brought to you by Hawaii Tracker, hawaiitracker.com, um, where you guys can come and donate to support our work. Um, if you are an advertiser, like to advertise on our page, you guys can check that out as well. Um, we will, we will um, certainly like to, to, to make this a sustainable thing for everybody and, and help some of you guys um, who've got nice businesses in the island get exposure here to, to our audience as well. So, all right, um, let me turn and see if I can put a uh, look at some questions. Um, thank you guys for joining in here. Merry Christmas, everybody. Happy New Year's Eve. Um, and let me see, there's a lot of comments on here, so I'm not sure I will be able to see them all. But let me try to load here some of these comments and questions on my page here on the side. So, thanks for bearing with me. And let's see if I can get these loaded here. All right, getting near you guys. Thanks for bearing with me. I'm driving a ship solo today once again. And let us let me see what questions we have. So, all right, checking on a chat. Merry Christmas, everybody. Um, let's see, you guys. A lot, a lot of comment. Um, Someone's talking about a massive sinkhole might develop and fall in a magma chamber. Well, so we don't believe there's any void space down under un, underneath here, right? Because of all the powdered rock, right? You can kind of imagine that a lot of rock was kind of broken down, and we had essentially 
on the order of 60,000 earthquakes in 2018, like a giant compactor just pounding, 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 pounding. It's almost like getting a, a jar of peanuts and you shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it. And all the little ones go to the bottom, all the big ones come to the top. So at the very bottom, you have all the smallest powdered rubble of the rock, right? So it's not very coherent. So it's not strong. It doesn't hold together. It can be pushed around. Um, but it's, there's no empty space down in there, if that makes sense, right? What can happen, though, is if the magma comes out fast enough in the area where the magma actually was, then the volcano can actually sag after that and kind of make that kind of collapse pit. You know, you guys actually forgot to go into a whole, a whole uh, one last section of our, of our presentation here. Um, so I want to make sure I'm going to get to that here, but uh, I'll, I'll put it up on the screen so I don't forget. We're going to talk about the history of the caldera a little bit, but I will continue going, going through questions. Is there any activity in the Lower East Rift Zone? Um, no, there is not. Um, Someone's talking about the, 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 the weight of the lava. So let's let's see here. Um, maybe going through the, his, the history of the volcano will actually help you guys um, understand what's normal here. So um, is there danger of the volcano? This one right now is not dangerous because uh, it's the, the biggest danger is a gas coming out of it. But it's actually within a national park where there are no houses, no residences, and any of that. Right? That was kind of a big difference in 2018. Um, so um, let's see. Um, yeah, uh, see, uh, yeah, uh, someone is speculating that the volcano is close to exploding because the, uh, the tremors are very weak, uh, only below magnitude 2. I see that in Portuguese from uh, Hernandez. Um, but that could be true if we saw signs of pressure building and an inflation. But both of the satellites and all our tilt meters are showing the volcano actually sagging instead. So I don't believe that to be the case. Right? So, oh yeah, so yeah, we have some Brazilians in here. Yeah, um, I was actually raised in Brazil many years ago. Como vai, gente? So, let's see here. Um, what else? Could it be the ink is running out? No, this is actually digital. So, they actually, this is actually potted digitally on a seismograph. There's, there's, there's no change in the ink over there as well. So, all right. I'm going to keep my comments to the volcano here. Um... How long has been a little slow? It's true, yeah. So, um, um, someone's talking about how the, the the western vents may become drains when they're submerged. That may well be the case. Yeah, there's already one lower western vent submerged, and it may well become a drain. And it could be that the that the eastern vent becomes a drain, and the western vent becomes more active. If those are all connected at depth by fingers into one common area, then you can shut one off and actually have a higher one and be able to be where the, where the lava comes out, right? It kind of all depends on the shape and the width of all and like the pathway for all the, for the magma to get through there. But that is that is possible as well. Yeah, so, okay. Um, let's see. I think I have gone through the live chat on most of it on YouTube. So, um, I do see one more question here that, uh, were we completely surprised that this event happened? No, um, if you guys will go back and look at our updates from a month ago, from you know, two months ago, we've been talking about the pressure building in this volcano for a while. We've been talking about the alert level possibly being, being raised to yellow about a month ago, um, before the intrusion even happened. That, that was two weeks before the actual eruption began. So, um, I know this is not for everybody to go into this much detail. We're kind of tailoring to people who are really into the science here. Um, but, uh, um, um, certainly, this is not a surprise to, to those of us. Maybe exactly when, exactly how, yes, that was surprising, but the fact that something was going to happen soon, that was not a surprise, right? If that makes sense. Um, so as far as uh, ladder dynamics, um, could, there, could there be pressure release, release and magma coming out of the lower east rift zone? Um, long term, yes. Short term, no. We don't see any signs of that happening in a short term. Now, long term, the rift zone is a path of magma. Magma is going to go back through there sooner or later. G guaranteed to happen. It's a geologic certainty, right? So the geologic risk is real. Geologic risk isn't the only factor for people living in the lower east rift zone, of course. So you got to balance that. So when you guys start feeling anxiety of, oh my god, like there's magma at the volcano again. I can see it. You know, it's over there. You know, um, Maybe to come back over here. I don't understand quite how that happened. It might happen again. You have to remember that you live in a certain area for a reason, right? And that might be the quality of life. It might be the air quality. It might be the community, the like-minded people. It might be 
any combination of those things, the history, your roots in the area, all those things are important, equally important as well. And I'm only informing on geologic risk. So geologic risk, the rift zone, is, is going to erupt again someday, guaranteed. But that's okay, right? You know, the island is made from eruptions, right? It kind of repaves itself over and over and over. And so what I really want to prevent is any kind of ignorance that that is a real risk. It is a real risk. And, you know, like all risks, it's up to individuals to choose what is a risk worth taking, right? So we'll kind of leave it at that, yeah? So... Um, all right, so I will switch to Facebook questions here and some Facebook questions. Uh, well, a lot of Facebook questions, so um, let me scroll back here. So thank you guys for tuning in. Um, I will end the update here soon to get back to my family here on Christmas Eve. Um, but I want to finish off and be a couple other questions here. So thank you guys for all joining from all over the place. And I'm looking for... What's the possibility of PGV causing an eruption? Um, absolutely none. There's nothing to do with PGV. There's nothing happening by PGV. There's no connection from there to here. There's really no. This is not nothing to do with PGV, right? We can talk about PGV more in the future, but as far as this eruption, we're we're I don't know how far, twenty miles away, and there's nothing happening in PGV, which is in the lower east rift zone. All the signals we showed you guys, the tilt, the GPS, everything, nothing happening down there. No connections at all. All right, so um, let's see here. Um, any thoughts that the pressure will equalize once the vent will submerge and it will eruption wane? That's possible. Um, that's that's real, really the big big unanswered question. I mean, you know, without really knowing exactly the dynamics in there, we don't know if that thing is going to start, stop, start, stop. Um, if it's going to um, keep bubbling up and through and kind of keep circulating over and over and over, kind of establish a, what, one path up for for uh, for output and one path down for draining. Um, so all of that. So let's see. Um, any more um, questions? Um, let's see. Mahalo, you guys, for, tuning, for, for tuning in. Um, and let's see. What other comments and questions on here? I'm kind of trying to scroll through and just kind of cherry pick them out because I want to kind of keep it short here, you guys. And we'll not be doing an update tomorrow, but we'll come back to you guys uh, the following day and give you guys another update here. So the question is, should I put Mauna Loa on green? And, you know, um, I think I'm fine with it being yellow. You know, you could put it on green, but, you you know, how often do you want to change the alert level? We put it, put it to green now, and we put it back up to yellow when this eruption in the Kilauea is over, possibly in a few weeks. Um, might be too much back and forth, back and forth, right? So it's kind of the long-term trend you're looking at. And the long-term trend of Mauna Loa is that it's still inflating. It's still swelling. Magma is still coming into the shallow chamber. Um, there have been patterns of earthquakes, you know, many more so before this current eruption of Kilauea. Um, so overall, the pattern is still filling, and so yellow is, is warranted to me. And that's why I would have suggested that Kilauea was also warranted yellow a month ago, because it was showing as much activity, if not more, than, than Mount Loa was at that point in time. All right, so do I think the original fissure that's now covered is still effusing? Um, I don't know. Those, kind of the two, that, those two lower fissures, like the middle one and that western, the northwestern one, um, um, we're both drowning in our mouth underneath, underneath a considerable amount of lava. So I'm not sure if they're still putting things out, especially with the other options of where they can come out of, of the other side. So I'm not quite sure there. So um, Another question, do I think this will drive more large magnitude quakes in the Lower East Rift Zone? Um, the short answer is no, because uh, it takes time for like the ground to, you know, essentially like recharge, right? Essentially, like it's gotta, the ground has got to collect all that pressure to be able to release it all at once in a big jolt, right? The ground is not stuck. It's not collecting that pressure that thing is still sliding after 2018 still today it's still loose and so for that to happen um it has to be mobile and so magma can still move move through the area and fill without having to have a big a big jolt which is good because it can kind of fill more passively instead of now suddenly it's a giant space for it to go into it can all just rush in there and now suddenly it's out of out of balance and it can start popping up and doing all kinds of crazy other things so kind of the slow adjustment is what we want um, and I don't believe that, you know, um, in a short term, any more large magnitude earthquakes in the Lower East Rift Zone. Case in point, before that 6.9 earthquake in 2018, the last earthquake on a south flank in that area that was of that, of that size, 1975, right? So we're looking at um, 25, you know, 40 some years, yeah, um, between those big events. That's about the recharge time for big events on the south flank. So you could also have other dynamics of the South Bank moving, but not big earthquakes, of course, as well. So um, as far as Walleye, no action on Walleye. Um, let's see what else here. Um, how big is the island compared to the size of the Lava Lake in 2018? I have to 
find that um, for you guys. Um, but um, maybe I can do that here. You guys, just give me a second to try to try to look that up here. Um, I'm gonna find out for you guys how big the exact dimensions of the. Okay, so the lava lake in 2018 um, was about 180 meters by 250 meters, right? So yes, um, 150 meters across is not quite the full size of that inner lava lake. Let me open this for you guys here and pull it over. All right. Let me make this a little bigger here. All right, so the 2016 size of this lava lake. 180 meters by 250 meters. And so we're talking about 150 meters diameter for that island within the pit. Even if it's not exactly, so let's see, the short axis is this way on this image right over here. And so um, it, maybe the island is something like that size, right? It's actually pretty big, pretty big pretty lake. So good question. Thanks for that, uh, John. Um, let's see. Steam vents in the park output has increased quite noticeably. Any thoughts about that? Steam vent output is something that varies quite a lot depending on the air temperature, depend, depending on the rainfall in the recent weeks before that. So it's kind of, that's something that, that is a longer term variation that we kind of talk about years over years over years. And um, there's not really a whole lot um, related to what's happening hour to hour day to day within the volcano and eruption itself. All right, so let's see. I think I've gotten through enough questions. I'm gonna switch over now to give you guys a history of this uh, caldera, right? So what I'm showing you guys now is, uh, an image from 1823 from the, joy, the voyage of William Ellis, Reverend William Ellis was the first missionary to come to Kilauea. And this is a, a, a colorized uh, sketch um, the, that, was, that was done while he was here in a volcano. And kind of see outer caldera rim is way up here, right? You can kind of see there's an inner crater, another inner crater, another inner crater, and lava lake in, in the middle of it, right? So not that different from what we have going on now. The thing had actually collapsed in 1790. It was the last big explosion, the last big pit, um, after which we, we actually um, have Hawaiian oral tradition, right? The, 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 the stories that the Hawaiians tell speak of four different water bodies, four ponds at the bottom of that explosion collapse pit of 1790. So we know there was water in 1790. We know that it was refilled by 1823. Of course, we don't have any data in between there. That's a real problem with this old, old information if you don't know what happened, how fast it was, because we don't have information from every hour, every day like we do today. Right? People would have to walk up, walk up here or ride up here on a horse. Um, to, and, you know, it was a many day journey, a um, couple of days from Hilo, one day if you were fast at it, right? Um, so it's not something people were doing all the time. So you can kind of see, um, certainly, we've seen patterns of lava lakes refilling within collapsed pits before. Crater edge, crater edge, crater edge, crater edge right in there, right? There's a hill over here. These hills, that's probably a cinder cone. So lava probably ripped out of the crack between this caldera and made a little eruption over here. You got some black rock over here. Lava might come out of this crack at some point in time, right? So every one of these cracks is a possible pathway from magma, from the magma chamber deep underground over here. And Ellis, when he arrived, described 51 conical islands rising around the edge, of, edge or from the surface of the burning lake. 22 constantly emitted smoke or pyramids of brilliant flame and several streams of lava, which rolled in the blazing torrents into the boiling mass below. So you can I see that when a crust actually forms and gets thicker, then a gas actually punches through there and starts making these little features that were called hornitos, and they put out a bunch of gas and they can shoot out lava as well. But kind of moving on, I'm going to show you guys a series of maps here, right? This is the, this is the map view of that same image we just saw here. So these are all those little hornitos, all these little vents on a crust of, of the lava lake. And you have a bigger lava pit kind of more in here, right? And essentially a big area where you have activity inside the biggest collapse pit. There one collapse pit there, then another one over here, right? And then the actual caldera wall being kind of like this, going around more this way like that, right? He's actually part of the caldera there. Yep, so, all right. Stepping forward to 1841. So you guys can kind of see, I'm going to go back and forth here, right? This is kind of the best approximations we have, right? You can kind of see a similar pattern. We've now refilled a lot of the bottom of that pit, right? And 
but we still have within a pit here and another crater, another crater here, right? And so in between here to get this, these areas of this wide black ledge, quite often you have to have the lava come up and spill over and flow out in every direction from that hole. And then later afterwards, after all the lavas come out of the ground, driven by the gas, a bottle of champagne, essentially it's burping and releasing the gas and you know, the gas is driving it out. So the lava then is on top. And then you might have some space where the lava just came from. And so that area might collapse a little bit. And so you actually have quite often these kind of collapse pits within the middle. And then within, within some time, lava comes back in and refills them and it actually um, flattens the ground again. So you kind of have a layer, layers of flat ground or refill area eras and these kind of cliffs indicate collapse eras in between, right? So that's fascinating to 1841, 1846, right? You kind of see not that different. Um, the whole interior is kind of being filled in and you can kind of see that that lava is forming a pit and it's almost up to the edge of this rim. That's what, what this notation is showing us over here. We're going to skip forward to 1861. And by now we no longer see any pit anymore, right? A little bit of, of a cliff edge over here, a little bit over there, right? Um, we now have a mound over the lake, right? This is forming a small lava shield and profile. It looks something like that. And so this kind of can feed flows at a go down off of this hill into other areas of the caldera until they come against some kind of cliff. So like on this west side, it can't really go that far, but to the northeast, it can go quite a distance as well until it hits some other cliff perhaps, right? So 1874, we have a big collapse pit in here now. And so once again, we have these cycles of collapse and, and uh, uh, our next update, um, if we have a chance, uh, maybe maybe a couple updates from now um, because we'll have to catch up. We'll go through the actual collapse cycles, what we know about collapses, how often things collapse and how fast they refill in more detail. For now, I want to give you guys more of a visual history right in the map area. And this is the first temple map we have from 1919 of Kilauea Caldera. And here we have an elevated hill of Hale Mau Mau. You guys can't see these contours, right? But this is actually showing about 3,800 feet elevation, right? That's taller than over here, right? So the top of this hill in this, in this table map is taller than over here. And so at this point, if it fills up enough, it can kind of fill to the point where it might overtop this wall. And if it spills out of the caldera, the whole thing, the place that does that is over here. Now that was much more likely in the, in the 1920s. Um, and that's totally impossible now because you have so many holes to fill before we actually get to that point in time. So I want to point out there's a, a fantastic book Rest Geology of Hawaii by Rick Hazlitt and um, Donald Hinman. And in there where they have kind of a similar kind of summary over here, you can kind of see 1823, 1829, 1832, different ways and kind of different different images um, of the evolution of this crater over time, right? You kind of see collapsed, refilled, collapsed, refilled, collapsed, refilled. Then it's a big um, shield pit flowing over. And then there was another kind of explosion in 1924, and then by 71, it was kind of essentially refilled once again. So the pattern of collapse, refilled, collapse, refilled, collapse, refilled is all, is a very normal thing, right? So we're seeing that happening right here today. So kind of zooming in on the, the 1924, uh, that kind of that hill of Hale Mau Mau, here's like a view of it kind of um, drawn on a virtual map, different uh, um, margins of it. So this is showing 1892. It was actually like this, 1886, it was farther back over here, 18, later in 1892 was over here, 1906 it was right in here, right? So it's kind of closing in, it was kind of freezing from the edges and closing in tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter as it went higher and higher and higher, right? And so this little cross section here on the right shows us, you know, how it filled in from down here at 600 feet more or less to 1,200 feet, 600 feet that it filled in um, within that conduit right within that pit that was growing over there and so what does that look like today right so this is a map a geologic map of the summit of the volcano uh before the collapse right and so this is showing this is a was active lava lake 2018 here's where it spilled over onto the floor of Hale Mau Mau crater that's this red blob right in here um this pit over here is Hale Mau Mau crater that was where the explosion in 1924 blasted out that smaller vent that was a lava lake conduit blasted it out over the course of two weeks of explosions and widened it by four times and made it four times deeper and made that big crater, which afterwards was refilled with lava. The floor over here is 1974, so lava came back into this crater also many, many, many times. We'll show you guys a little bit of that, that history as well. But every one of these different colors over here is a different spillover from this old hill that used to be in this place. In 18, 
1888, things spill over in this direction, over here. 1892, spills over this way and leaves this mark, right? In 1918, it spills over over here. 1921, it spills over over here. Over this way as well. Over this way as well, right? 1919 is this huge, huge, huge one all here. That's 1919 spillover, right? And kind of see older ones kind of buried 1882 to 85 way over here, right? So all this recent stuff from 54, 75, 54, 21 is all kind of covering this 82 stuff, the oldest part, right? And we have 1971, we have 1974, and we have more off the map in that direction. I'm not showing you guys, but kind of all these are all different overflows of the lava lake over time that have kind of been preserved on the crater floor. Um, before the collapse, and then since the collapse, now the vault shifted around, some pieces are missing, here's what's actually left. So we kind of still have chunks of those overflows on this down drop block over here. There's a little bit of 1888, a little bit of 1882 that's kind of cut off by this big cliff. Another part of it's up here right now, yeah? Or 1919 is cut off pieces here, and the rest of it's up here. Another part of 1919 is down here. It's kind of been, been divided, right? You have 1921 over here, right? And likewise, have chunks kind of all over the place. So that's what it looks like now as far as the follow-up on that, right? So let me just show you guys. I'm going to go through this kind of quickly. and give you guys more like a visual slideshow. We don't have time lapses going for these you know, eras going back. The best I can do is kind of go through pictures fairly quickly to give you guys an idea of how this image is, how the, the caldera changed over time. So this is the oldest photograph we have, 1855. Um, you can kind of see these different fumaroles vents here within the caldera of Kilauea, right over here. This is taken from Volcano House. If you guys have been there, you can see this, this bench of trees here in the foreground, right? So the caldera and the, la the main lava lake would have been kind of behind a few more off in this direction over here. Um, 1850s, this is a, a painting. You can I see a very similar view, but colorized. 1865, there's a caldera wall. There's a buried inner cliff, another buried inner cliff. And there's a lava lake in there, right? If you guys have been to the Uikahuna Bluff, Jagger Overlook. In the past, you, you might recognize this knob, which is kind of in the foreground still there today. Yeah. 1880s. There's our lava lake, right? There's the crust of it, right? And so one thing that can happen if the vents, vents become submerged is it can start fountaining up through the crust of the lake, something like that. Right? So this might be, might be something we looked at before, or, or might see in the future again, right? If I've seen it before, we might see it again. And look at this. Islands. We see islands floating within this lava lake as well. So also seeing that again. Ferneau painting from the 1880s, right? The USGS actually has published uh, um, a, a booklet that, that describes the, the value of these old paintings um, to the history of the, of the volcano. And so they've dated these, and this is kind of, kind of coming from there as well. So you kind of see these big slabs of rock that are kind of, kind of tipped up in there, like these big crags, right? You know, like you can kind of, you can have gas that can kind of burst and push some of these rocks and slabs upwards. And then as they get pushed by the lava lake, they can kind of tilt and move, and you can have these really interesting craggy features right through there, yeah? And over here, you can kind of see it looks like bubbling coming through the crust of the lake right in there, right? And, and this is painted almost like there's a reflection on there. And of course, this painting in 1880, Mauna Loa is in the background. If you guys remember 1880, 81, Mauna Loa, there's fountains of lava. There's a flow that comes down towards Ka'u. There's a flow that goes to the other side towards Hilo. Um, and that's a whole other story as well, but Mauna Loa in 1880 was also happening, right? 1885, Tavernier. Same kind of craggy shapes right through here, right? I know I'm ruining these guys' paintings by scribbling all over them. Maybe I can stop doing that so much, right? But I do want to point out, you know, like the, the, the gas venting through the crust of the lake once again within here. Yeah. Another little, little vent right over here on the right. All right, 1885, now we have a photograph, right? I'm going to point out, there's people down in here. There's people on the very edge of the lake. You can walk down there. Um, we're within a crater, collapsed crater over here, and so those other craters are kind of too far down to actually see any of those upper upper crater walls, but it's a lot of like 1885. 1886, there was a collapse. We're calling it a breakdown in this caption over here. And you can kind of see a big pit steaming at the bottom. It might be lava down there. But certainly there was a collapse, and it refills from there once again. 1893. By this point in time, um, it's refilled. Actually, we have a perched pond right here. Like, the lava is actually coming up and over. It spills over the edge of this crater. It kind of freezes on a cold edge, and it kind of rises this rim upwards. It kind of makes this elevated swing pool kind of a feature, right? This is an actual photograph from Brother Bert Bertram. Um, but there are other renditions of this as well. So I appreciate the photograph without my scribble. 
And now I can appreciate the photograph, uh, the painting by Hitchcock, the same scene in 1893. And you can see one of those spillovers coming right through here. Mauna Loa covered in snow in the background, fantastic painting as well. 1894, Hitchcock as well, right? This is the, the Dana Pond, as they called it. And the, that thing was rising up. Can you see how much higher it is than the, than the floor level? And this is very shortly before the whole thing collapsed once again. So filling, collapse, filling, collapse is kind of normal. So I have, we have, I have a big gap in the in the, the imagery, uh, at least that I have compiled for you guys today. 1911, we see here that caldera wall out of here, the edge of another crater on the inside, and there's lava inside of there as well. Okay. 1916, there is the, the, the crater. You guys may recognize this as familiar lava lake floor surface right in here, and once again, islands. Islands in here, right? floating around, many more of them than we actually have now, right? So 1916, and it's interesting how you could come to Kilauea every different year you see something different, and that's still true today, and that's what makes Kilauea such a fascinating place to visit and to study and to learn about, and that's why I share with you guys is because every year it's different, and that's something that, you know, kind of as a set aside here, um, as a geologist, geologic time is something that's really hard for people to actually grasp and comprehend, right? And so only certain places like volcanoes and glaciers does geologic, geologic change happen at the same rate as people's lives occur day to day month to month year to year and so i can tell you guys like that every year of my life here in on hawaii i can relate what was happening that year in my life what was happening that year with a volcano and so that's something that's, that's kind of unique geologically to be able to relate the human time scale to the geologic time scale in times like this right so Really fascinating to come and see this year after year after year. And, you know, you guys getting a little little glimpse of that here with the different views of different years. 1916, right? These islands are kind of sticking quite high above. Lava, lava Lake is kind of low within this crater pit over here, right? So can I see how that changes over time here? 1917, Twig Smith painting, right? Island once again. And you can see gas venting through the crust of the lake, right? And none of these, four, these images do we see a vent above pouring in and all these all these paintings and photographs of the vent is below feeding the lake from below so you can see how how that can be the case and how these things could possible possibly sustain um 1917 um this is a panel picture by walden you kind of see a crater wall with a lava lake and islands bubbling up in here another island right and an unknown similar kind of view Big island. This guy's painting it right from lake level. So you can kind of see the edge of the lake kind of lapping up here on a shore, so to speak, right? And kind of the edge of the crater way, way up above there. All right, so 1918. Here's our islands again, right? Lava lake in between. 1920. The islands are a lot shorter. I don't know if they're submerged or different islands or exactly what's going on here, but the edge of the crater and the lava level is right up to the edge of it. Quite, 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 quite high. Right, 1921, picture by Thomas Geiger himself. Look how full that lake is, right? Look how many islands are floating around in there. These guys, Geiger's, Geiger's time, used to, used to uh, document the islands moving around, and moving and spinning and figuring out the dynamics of the flow. We'll maybe pull some, out some of those old old papers and, and um, share that with you guys since it's more relevant now since we have a lot of lakes circulating with an island in it. And once again, that'd be really, really interesting to see. And that was what we had until 1924, the big steam explosion that formed Hale Mau Mau. Um, and after that, we had seven eruptions in 10 years. I've been talking about that for a while now. This is that one one month eruption in that collapse pit after the 24 um, eruption. So this is is you know maybe what we're in for, something like this, right? Lava filling in the crater quite a bit. Look, islands within a bubbling lake. Once again, you guys by now understand that this is what's normal in Kilauea. Lava lakes on Kilauea summit is what's normal. Not having one is weird, right? So we actually have one again. And like the fact that we have one shouldn't be that worrying. Like the lava being up here is where it should be. It's only when things change in their monitoring signals and their rift zone. And farther over, we start to get more concerned about where it might actually move. But you know, intrusions of the rift zone and short eruptions are common. Most of the time, magma stays up at the summit. And lava lake areas have been very, very common over time, as you guys can kind of see through this presentation here. 52. We're still in an era of black and white now, right? We're inside of the explosion pit of Hale Mau Mau. It's within the caldera wall up here, right? And now we have another lava lake with islands and hornitos, little vents putting out the gas and the lava spatter, right? 
This one only lasted, this one lasted four months at 52. Right? 54, only three days. But down on the floor of Halamama once again, there it is, a big lake that filled the whole thing. 59, we had Kilauiiki, that was kind of you know, off the side. The lava lakes are mostly off in this direction. So we pan a little more back to the east, and we can see Kilauiiki. We talked about that a little bit yesterday, the massive fountains of lava falling out over to the west. And following that eruption, because the magma actually went from Kilauiiki down the rift zone, um, there was a collapse of the summit. Nowhere near as big as 2018, but enough that you actually can see a collapsed pit in here, and you can see lava draining into it. Now, why might that have actually happened? That's because uh, the previous lava lake from 52, 54 and 52, these ones over here, right? They were inside of the pit, so I don't have the image pulled up, but if the, if the pit is a cross-section like this and your lava lakes filled it up, then you have a core in the middle of it, like a jelly donut that's still fluid as it cools on the edges, but stays hottest and liquid in the middle. And so if you can collapse a hole through the middle of that, then you can get the middle of it to drain out into a new lower pit. And that's what's happening here. Let's see if you guys a little, a little um, aside on that little thing as well. So, um, 67, 68, we had, this is one of the longest spills, something like eight and a half months of lava um, spanning across the, the, the New Year's within a pit, filling the whole, like, right, so you have, like, have a central elevated pond in here, and kind of spillovers that come off to the sides of the things that repave the crater floor, right? And of course, this is kind of setting the stage for what we saw before 2008, before the new lava lake opened up over an air, right? Um, but before that happened, more eruptions, right? So lava doesn't have to come up just through that crack. Here's the caldera crack on the southern wall showing a big fissure, right? That lasted, I believe this was uh, um, only a few hours or, you know, maybe a day or so in 1974, 1971. And again, 1974 in a similar area right through there, right? Kind of fissures along the edge of there, yeah. In 75, that, so that earthquake I mentioned, the last one on the south flank, initially called a 7.2, revised a 7.5, calculated by some seismologists nowadays as a 7.7 .7 earthquake, was enough to give our magma chamber a nice big shake. And even if you have like a bottle of champagne, once again, that has already been popped, but you give it a good shake, you might get a little bit more gas and a little bit more sputter out of it. And so we had a one day eruption in 1975, immediately following the 7.7 .7 earthquake in the pit as well. So we're in the range of having magma in a pit and having cooled interior jelly donut middles and all these kind of different patterns, these are the kind of things that could happen. We could have one day eruptions from earthquakes. We could have, you know, small collapses that are kind of, you know, small and more fissures, not within a pit, but on a, on a wall, on an upper wall of the crater, right? On a, a coming across the edge. And um, that's also possible as well, right? Here's 1982. And this fissure in 1982 is actually coming across the upper crater floor and then cutting down a wall of Halimama crater, and then cutting across the floor of Halimama crater. Puts so that lava both within the pit and in the upper, upper Cut a floor right in here, right? And interestingly, this is like the east part. This is not that far off of where the current vent of 2020 is located, except that we're now down quite a bit, right? Or down um, on the order of, I would guess, 1,400 feet without doing the math very quickly, right? So that is the history of the caldera there. And so I will leave it at that. I've been going on for a while, you guys. I it's kind of still, still ended up going for a while, um, but I kind of wanted to share it out with you guys. Merry Christmas, everybody. I will answer any more questions on chat as time allows on the next couple of days. And we'll go back, to, back with you guys in a couple of days with another update, kind of recapping what happens over Christmas. And we'll kind of go into more details of refilling, collapses, those kind of patterns, and more detail as well. You know, the whole pattern of jelly donuts, um, address all your questions. Um, any questions we can't get, get to today or, you know, um, in a chat, we can address them in our, in our next video update as well. So, mahalo, you guys, for tuning in. Um, happy holidays. Aloha.